Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. Welcome to What's on Your Mind, Hawaii. I'm Tim Apicella. Today, we bring this show back into the studio to cover a topic that is getting some degree of concern for those who watch local news. Syncare Broadcasting Group is one of the largest media companies in the United States. Recently, the group found itself in the middle of a controversy by ordering its news anchors to read a script word for word, decrying the dangers of media companies of running fake news stories that they obtain from social media. The warning that media uh, companies, be it print or broadcast, uh, fake news, this sounds quite familiar to President Trump's often mentioned criticism of news media. Requiring news anchors to read pre-written scripts seems to be an overreach of a media company to demand from its journalists. This is particularly true since Sinclair owns 173 news stations across the country and required all of them to deliver a script. A video which went viral was produced by Deadspit.com eerily shows multiple newscasters reciting the scripts in perfect unison. Harsh criticism from the public has been directed to both Sinclair Broadcasting and to those local news anchors who delivered the script. News anchors have confided with newspaper reporters on a confidential basis because they're in fear of losing their jobs. They have been receiving a great deal of hate mail from viewers for their role. Most say they had no choice in the matter and hated delivering the script. With me today to discuss the issue of independent journalism versus a media corporate giant with political leanings and their influence on the local news is Brent Overgaard, Professor of Journalism for the School of Communications at UH Manoa. Brent, thank you so much for uh, joining us here today. This has been a, quite a serious topic that's come to light just recently. And um, for many, it's been a very serious topic and quite a, of quite concern. Yeah, it's quite troubling to see this. Uh, the way Deadspin put it together, I think, really brought the issue home of why we should be worried about and concerned that um, big conglomerates are reaching into the heartland and buying small stations and trying to spread their messages uh, throughout, throughout those outlets. Well, we all know that all po politics is local. So when mm -hmm. you get control of local news stations, by some way or another, maybe you influence politics. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of one of the concerns many people have. Yeah, it's also targeting a weakened uh, part of the journalistic structure where newspapers have been losing staff and losing resources and uh, these, these small TV stations don't have much in terms of journalists on their payroll, so um, a lot of times it's what's the easiest story we can do today and when you can fill air with these kinds of um, must you know, runs, must call runs, must yeah. runs. <laughs> right. uh, that, that kind of fills the void that they're constantly struggling with in terms of what's going to be on the air, makes their parent company happy, and uh, the big losers in all this are the viewers. Yeah. Well, I want to just take a quick look at what set this controversy off, and that was potentially anchors, news anchors from 173 stations reading a script that was basically directed from Sinclair Broadcasting Group to these news anchors. And I guess the point of this clip is, and it's been, it's been caught on from by all other news agencies. They have run with this. Uh, so this is, in a sense, a viral um, portrayal of this video and, and how eerie it is to see, you know, word for word, all synchronized. And so it's a news story that everyone's picked up on. So let's just take a quick look at that. The sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publish simply are true without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think, and this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. There's enough of that, but as you can see, it's, you can see why uh, you know. News anchors have, would have some concerns about this and why media companies have been showing this around the country for the last few days. Um, what was your impression of that? Well, I think the most uh, striking part of this is that if Deadspin wouldn't have clipped that all together, it would have been an, un an unnoticed, untold story in this whole Sinclair Broadcasting Group uh, saga. And the person who created it um, was clever enough to put it in a, in a form that people could really understand what was at stake here. 
and without that work, I don't, I don't think this would even be a story. Really? Yeah, because how would you know? I mean, know? that's quite I mean, a statement. Yeah, I mean, this is something that the uh, Deadspin person cr crafted to show what was, what was really um, happening. And without that, you just have an individual broadcast here, individual broadcast there. There's no way to really uh, comprehend it for most people. Yeah. Well, they did a beautiful job. And yeah. we, everyone owes them a credit and uh, a big credit to the fact that they've single-handedly have raised an issue that now is going viral, number one. And number two is the issue behind these viral videos. Yeah, it's so. a curious case of... Um, a, a journalistic organization creating a piece of media, a piece of coverage that becomes the story. Right. And uh, w again, without that video, I don't think people would have paid any attention to this must read. Because it's been going on for a long time and it happens in lots of stations. Well, that's what we're going to talk about a little bit on, in the show. And I wanted to ask you, why should the public be concerned that Sinclair Broadcasting Group is requiring news anchors to air the must runs uh, spots? And also having their anchors word a read a word for word script. Why why should the average viewer be even be concerned remotely concerned about that? Well, there's many levels uh, of uh, controversy there. But you start with the idea that who controls your news, and most people have the perception in these smaller and mid-sized markets that that their local news is created by local people who shop at the same grocery store as them and live basically the same lives as they do. Instead, it's uh, you know getting piped in from some you know headquarters, and I think it's uh, somewhere in Maryland, uh, basically right. directing this this broadcast propaganda type message into all of these different stations that are generally considered to be independent and also highly trusted. Local news is one of the most trusted parts of uh, the journalistic uh, you know media sphere. And people trust their local anchors and the people they see on TV that from their community because they they think they're just you know reporting local news, reporting you know what's happening around here, and they and they see those people every day. They let them into their living room. They uh, build a relationship with them. Now and, that's an interesting you know. point because I think a lot of a lot of the public, the viewers, you know, they maybe avoid the national news stories like Fox or MSNBC because they just, they're tired of it. They just don't want to get involved in the national politics. They're tired of the polarization of the Republicans versus the Democrats, and they've just had enough. So a lot of people have gone back to the local markets, mm -hmm. local news, to say, I want to get away from that. But the irony is Sinclair Broadcasting Company is interjecting, uh, if you will, some of the, the national headlines that they were trying to get away from in the first place. Right. Uh, Sinclair's um, MO when they take over a station is they reduce local coverage and they, and they reduce staff and then they increase national coverage. The Washington Post just did a, a study on this and they estimated it's a 25 percent increase um, in national coverage. So. Yeah, um, I, I saw uh, Emory University in Atlanta did a, a study on this between the study was involved 743 stations between 2017 and 2018. And in that study, when Sinclair took over a new station, um, the local stations were, you know, basically doing about 4% of political stories. Not soon after Sinclair acquired them, that went up to 25%. <laughs> so that's an amazing delta that occurs within one or two months of ownership of Sinclair. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's part of a pattern. It's not a coincidence or, or anything like that. It's part of their strategy. Mm -hmm. Their strategy is to um, Im influence people across the country. They're not so much interested in you know, what happens in El Paso, Texas. They're interested in having the most stations, the most reach, so they can broadcast their message to the most number of people. Well, let's talk a, let's talk a little bit about Sinclair and that exact reach. Um, Sinclair, basically, on the FCC website, uh, docket number 17-179 says that Sinclair Broadcasting Company owns 173 local news stations or 528 channels in 81 markets. Now, they're trying to acquire uh, Tribune Media, which owns 42 news stations in 33 markets. And if the FCC approves that acquisition, that, and right now the proposal is uh, Sinclair wants to spend three point nine billion dollars to acquire Tribune. Mm -hmm. And if that goes through, that will result of Sinclair having a 72% market share in all U.S. households. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I'm not familiar with the definition of monopoly or the Sherman Act of <laughs> antitrust, but 72% of market share for all media and local markets, that seems rel relatively high to me. Well, they'd be the largest uh, chain of TV stations, mm -hmm. which, I mean, you have to compare it to, say, the national stations like CNN or Fox News. You know, Fox News is the number one um, uh, cable station, so they have an enormous reach. Mm -hmm. And CNN, of course, they have a, a large reach, too. But what you're talking about here is a, is a kind of a filtering up from the bottom type of reach. And they're getting into these markets that um, wouldn't necessarily watch CNN or, or even Fox News. They're just, they, they, they work 12-hour days, they, people come home, they're tired, they, they turn on their local TV station and they want to know what's happening around them and they get this extra dose of propaganda stuck into their salad. You used the word propaganda. <laughs> and I think that word has been mentioned before by other concerned viewers. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what is the role of FCC, particular, per, particularly because we have a new administrator that was recently appointed by Donald Trump, um, Mr. Prajit Pai, and he has really turned around a lot of things that were quite the norm when it came to broadcasting standards. For example, um, the second he was basically appointed in 2017, the rule was reversed that all local news, or if you're an owner of local news, you had to have representation in the community. And that was an 80-year rule that's been basically dismantled. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that was the rule that plowed the way for Sinclair to come in and, and do other you know, acquisitions of local news stations at a higher percentage than normal or, or not. But, um, well, it's, it's, deregulation started in the mid-90s mm -hmm. uh, with the Telecommunications Act, and what happened was basically people felt that with the digital uh, emergence of, of channels and the internet that they could they could have uh, less strict guidelines on who owned what channels and in what markets and and uh, information would you know be fairly distributed among people what really happened was the people with the most money bought all the channels and then you have a, a magnification of uh, their voice that's like like we've never seen uh, people will buy more than one television station in one market, like you see here in uh, in Honolulu, they will buy the newspapers in the markets. Mm -hmm. They buy the radio stations, and suddenly, it's not that they own all the channels, right? But they, and this is the same with Sinclair. Sinclair doesn't own 70 percent of the channels around the nation. What they, what they have is a footprint in 70 percent of the market. Market share. Yeah. yeah so, um, in, in every place you might live you're going to have this, this uh, message circulating among the people living there. And that's, uh, that's the big concern about the, the consolidation and also the monopolistic practices. So I guess my question is, we'll get maybe a little bit more into this after the break, but who's the watchdog to prevent a monopolization of communications? Well, it's supposed to be the FCC. But if you have a... Um, director like we have now who's who's basically knocking down all the walls and gates then uh, there's not too much to stop it uh, and it gets into we already ha we already have a big problem with media consolidation throughout the country this far preceded uh, Trump or, or anybody else mm -hmm. but um, you know basically like I said it started in the mid 90s when people started buying chains right. and things and what we, we have is fewer and fewer people owning more and more of our channels, and then... Um, the sphere of influence increases. Yeah, so and a lot of it is we don't even know what's being left out. You know, well, let's a lot get, of it's behind the scenes. Let's get back to that after okay. this commercial, because you've hit on a very important topic. So, I'm Tim Apicella, and I'm here. We're talking about Sinclair Broadcasting Group, and we'll be right back. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. 
Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome back to What's On Your Mind Hawaii. We're talking about Sinclair Broadcasting Corporation, basically buying up the local market share of uh, local news stations. I'm here with Brett Obergaard, and he is professor at University of uh, Hawaii, uh, University of Hawaii at Manoa, and he, your professor in the School of Journalism for the School of Communications. Associate professor, School of Communications in the journalism program. Sorry. Yeah, he gave me a promotion. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that as long as it's accompanied with pay. <laughs> yeah. okay. Well, I wanted I want to talk about. We talked a little bit before break about um, the FCC and Sinclair as far as its size. Mm -hmm. Now, when this controversy came to play, um, actually President Trump chimed in. Not surprisingly, <laughs> in fact, he chimed in about at 2:34 a.m. on April the third on Twitter account. Okay. No surprise there either. Yeah, yeah, right. um, what he said, though, in regards to this controversy of Sinclair having these anchors read a script and, you know, through all their markets throughout the country. Uh, so what he said was, this is President Donald Trump, the fake news networks, those that knowingly have a sick and biased agenda, and that was all caps agenda, <laughs> are worried about the, comp the competition and the quality of Sinclair broadcast. The fakers at CNN, NBC, ABC, CBS have done so much dishonest reporting that they should only be allowed to get awards for fiction. <laughs> so that's our commander in chief um, protecting our First Amendment rights <laughs> and the media's First Amendment rights, but that's our president of the United States. Any comments about that little tweet? Well, I mean, it's just this classic uh, propaganda that we get from this president in, in the sense that there's no um, detail to it, there's no specifics to it, it's just a smear. And uh, his basic strategy is to smear anybody that doesn't agree with him instead of dealing with, um, you know, the particulars of his concern. Mm -hmm. Like, if you, have a, if you have a particular complaint with a media organization about something they publish, you, re you request a, a correction. And then the company will investigate and see if they're wrong. And if they're wrong, they run a correction. And that's standard practice. No, no journalism organization can be perfectly correct all the time. It's just impossible. Because sources give you wrong information. Documents are wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, people transpose things on their notes. Reporters there's, are human beings. They're human Journalists beings, are human beings. And there's things that go wrong. Yeah. So what really, the, the journalistic ideology is about correcting errors if you make them. You try not to make them. That's right. the first step. Right. Second, and, you, and then the second step, you try to triangulate your information to make sure that uh, if somebody tells you something wrong, you catch it with your second or third source. But if a mistake gets in, then you have a formal, transparent process where you say, we made a mistake, here's our mistake, here's the correct information, and we just wanted you to know that. And the New York Times does a great uh, job of this. Sometimes they'll correct things a hundred made mistakes made a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? You know, yeah, somebody will say, "Hey, I was reading an old copy of the New York Times. I found this mistake," and they'll they'll correct it. And that's the kind of um, idea, uh, e exemplar ideology that mm -hmm. um, journalists strive for. Yeah. Now, what this particular tweet is saying is that if because all of these organizations have made a mistake at some point in their um, existence, they're all fake, and everything they do is fiction. Which is it's. Uh, a laughable claim. Yeah. Well, it wasn't by coincidence that the executive chairman of Sinclair Broadcast Group said that print media serves no real purpose. <laughs> and then he further on said, I must tell you that in all the 45 plus years I've been in the media business, I have never seen a single article about us that is reflective of reality, especially in today's world with shameful political environment and generally complete lack of integrity. Facts and truth have been lost for a long time and likely never to return. The print media is a left wing and is meaningless dribble, which accounts for why the industry will fade away, just no credibility. Now, 
That is the chairman of Sinclair Broadcast News. Mm -hmm. Now, not to be outdone though, uh, there's always a, um, an opposite answer to everything. So the Society of Professional Journalists, which most journalists subscribe to right. for their content information and a guideline for ethics. That's the code of ethics is what binds journalists. The right. SBJ code or other code of ethics. Right. That's, what, that's what it's that all about. It's, we don't have licenses. We don't have some kind of test we take. We either prescribe to the code of ethics or not, and the people who prescribe to it are the ones uh, are they're considered journalists. So this is what National President Rebecca Baker said in response to uh, David Smith. And that is, it appears Mr. Smith is attempting to discredit any and all journalism except that produced by 193 television stations he uh, won, wants or controls throughout 39 states. This is a serious attack on not only to thousands of hardworking print journalists across the country, but on the free press as protected in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. It is not good for the country or journalism to have any one individual or company control such a large portion of news being broadcast. And I should say after this tit-for-tat response, um, David Smith is going to be meeting with the, social, uh, the Society of Professional Journalists to discuss this very issue. Hmm. So I don't know when that meeting's taking place, but it's, it's going to take place. Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's quite an argument he's making that everybody makes fake news except for us and only watch our stations. I mean, this is a, uh, it's kind of a, a charlatan argument that um, you, you would make about any kind of, or only a, a most disreputable type of salesman would make about their competitors. So if you want to control the sentiment of the country, basically also how you get your votes, isn't reshaping the media probably one of the most effective ways of doing it? Well, there's, yeah, there's a lot of ways to, um, for that to play out in, in modern um, media structure because you have social media, you have um, extended interpersonal media through mobile devices. But mm -hmm. that said, uh, uh, you know, the, the biggest channels get the most ears and eyes. Mm -hmm. And if you can get into those, that's what... You know, that's the right. best way to sell your message. It's, yeah. just, it's just a numbers game. And like you said, people at the end of the day are tired. They just want to go to their local news and watch lo local news interest stories. And yeah, I mean, one of the they things don't expect <laughs> Sinclair to be interjecting their national political messages in there. Right. In the, in the beginning of democracy, people understood that they had to earn it. You know, they had to um, be a citizen to make it work. Mm -hmm. They had to spend some of their day building their democracy. Today, people t kind of take it for granted, I think, and they don't put in the time or in have interest in, in uh, perpetuating democracy. So they just want to watch their TV news and expect it's going to be okay. Uh, so the, really, the, uh, the onus is on the viewer to figure out what is, is real, what is valid, what is reliable in terms of news. And I don't sense that... Uh, a large number of Americans really want to do that work. Well, they're so pressed for time, for one. And pressed for time. Yeah, and then, you know. And they're also all, have become tribal, you know, in terms so. of. Our politics have become very tribal. Yeah, and so it's a lot easier to just say, is this person a Republican or are they a Democrat? If they're a Republican, well, I agree with everything they say. If they're a Democrat, I disagree with everything, and then vice versa. And that takes no work. Yeah. <laughs> in the intro of the show, I mentioned that those news anchors that did read this script, um, required by Sinclair Broadcasting Group, they've been taking a lot of heat. And I guess the question is, when students are in the School of Journalism or Communications and they're taught about SPJ's Code of Ethics, um, what are they taught? Are they taught that this is not an easy business and you will be placed between a rock and a hard spot, uh, spot as a journalist? And what is your obligation to that code versus um, I call it the hanging sword method of persuasion from an employer to mandate that you do something that may be in direct violation or opposition to your code of ethics. What, what do you think? What do you guys teach in the School well, of Journalism? Well, I mean, to begin with, our foundational document is the SBJ Code of Ethics. So mm -hmm. we, we build our structure on top of that. We don't build classes saying uh, that you're likely to run into a bunch of unscrupulous people who are going to make you violate this. But what we do have we do have entire classes about ethics and the gray area of ethics, 
And even though this code we use is quite um, well done and detailed, there, there are always gray areas. Mm -hmm. And so what we teach our students is the process to you know, figure out what you're dealing with here, where it fits with the code, where it's in between parts now, of the code. The one I'm thinking of specifically within the code of ethics is to act independently, mm -hmm. for all journalists to act independently. And I'm not sure how that kind of, you know, how that looks when a journalist is required to read a script from a national conglomerate in Maryland. Mm. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that uh, in any job you have in journalism, you know, you have a job and you have a paycheck and you have bills to pay. You have to decide, does this particular affront to your sensibilities um, demand that you resign immediately? Or do you just uh, reject? There's a, there's a couple options here. Number one, you read it and you keep your job and, and move on with life. Number two, you say, I just won't read it, which some people did. There was a woman in uh, Eugene that I read, she just said, I'm not going to do it, and she posted a, a photo of the SBJ Code of Ethics on her Facebook. Wow. And said, That's, I'm not going to do it. Good for her. And then there are other people who resigned. Uh, but that's a hard choice for any boss to put on you, like say, read this or, well, or we're going to fire you. And they also have these elaborate contracts. You know, well, the contracts in. also may specify that you have to pay back Sinclair mm -hmm. a certain portion of your salary should you, you know, leave the company. Right. So we're almost out of time. Um, I think the next show that we're going to do, you're going to be here with Jay Fidel, and you're going to talk about what can be done about this infiltration of Sinclair Broadcasting Group in today's marketplace of media. So, uh, Brett, I want okay. to thank you so All much right. for joining us yeah. today. Great pleasure. Uh, your comments have been really uh, very well-timed and, and very poignant. So thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, this is Tim Apicella. This is What's on Your Mind, Hawaii, and we'll see you in two weeks. Aloha.